Thanks. Okay, um, I guess I should start by admitting that I'm no expert on phenotyping, although I want to talk to you about engineering of photosynthesis for food security and adaptation to climate change. And of course, photosynthesis is a process which is ideal, ideally suited to phenotyping because there are so many spectral components, both in reflectance and fluorescence, that we can utilize in phenotyping. And I'm going to mention a little bit of that during my talk. And also phenotyping at different levels, from metabolism through to filled crops. Um, I should say that we're particularly interested in being able to phenotype in, in the field. And uh, you can find out more about this on Carl Bernanke's poster. Carl, put up your hand wherever you are. Yep, so he's right at the back there. But Carl has been pushing... We, we also had a trait spotter, except ours had to be pushed around for the last five years. And uh, now we have the spider cam system where the hyperspectral sensors, the LIDARs are now all suspended. This was too heavy to put on a drone. But now with um, the spider cam, we can now cover a four hectare area, technically looking at every plant in there. And we're particularly interested in that because, you know, as many of you, we're primarily interested in field crops and what works in the greenhouse doesn't always perform that well in, in the field. I should also start by thanking the sponsors of the work I talk about. Most of it is on this project realising increased photosynthetic efficiency, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. I'll also talk about some other work funded by the US Department of Energy. I should also mention that this really does have a lot of connections to Wageningen because four of the people who've worked with us are all graduates of Wageningen. Um, Ank Mikkelsen was one of our uh, program coordinators. Vanna Kromdijk, a, now a professor at University of Cambridge, conducted a lot of the work I talk about. Um, Fleur Burwinkle also was a program manager with us. And Stephen Drever, who is here, worked with us on phenotyping of um, structure, leaf structure, that is. So, so what is the problem we're thinking about? Well, many of you will know, following the Green Revolution, the number of people in the world who were short of calories, starving, essentially, declined considerably. And that decline continued until about um, 2014, when it started to reverse. And each year since 2014, the number of people who are calorie insufficient has been steadily rising. Um, today, about one in 10 people on the planet do not have enough food to, to eat, literally. Um, the problem is worse in parts of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, very minor in North America and, and Europe at, at the present time. But all the projections are that this situation is going to continue to worsen. Um, and, of course, conflicts exacerbate the problem. But many of these people are not actually in conflict zones. So it is, again, a rising problem, um, as it was in the 50s and 60s, solved by the Green Revolution. So we do need new innovations. Um, if we look at you know, what we've been able to do since the 60s. This is average annual yields of rice across the globe. So each of these dots is the actual FAO data point. And you can see it's been steadily rising since the 60s. Some would argue that in the last 10 years, in the case of rice, that has flattened. But if we just project forward and we say, well, we can continue doing that, by 2050, we'll end up here. But the UNFAO say, actually, we need to end up here because rising population and, in particular, changes in diet. So the emerging or emerged, recently emerged economies are demanding much more grain as their diets 
move more towards a Western diet. So this is rice, this is wheat. And of course, what we really need is for what we're achieving to be above demand because that gives the surpluses, the buffer, the sort of event that's happening now where with shortages of grain supply from Russia and Ukraine, we've seen a tripling of, of wheat prices. If we had sufficient reserves, that, that would not happen. Now, this is a slide that Ken Gillow um, provided to me, where, again, looking at wheat, well, we could also solve the problem if we reduce demand, i.e. our diets become more vegetarian, we decrease losses in the supply chain as well. Unfortunately, globally, these things are going in the opposite direction. And of course, it would be great if these things did solve the problem. But producing more on each hectare of land we're using is still a good thing because the more we can produce on the hectares of land we're using, the less land we need for agriculture and the more that can be uh, released for rewilding or forestry projects. And then we have the elephant in the room where we still don't really know how it's going to impact us, climate change. Now, if we look a bit more deeply into this issue, um, this is showing the decadal improvement in yields of rice for the three major uh, rice producing countries in the world. Now, in the 70s and 80s, China was increasing its productivity per hectare of land by around 30 to 40 percent, the years of the Green Revolution. By the, in the two decades of this century, that has been reduced to single figures. And what's remarkable about this is China's investment here is massive compared to what it was here. So this is telling us it's getting harder and harder to keep these yield increases going. Now, why, where does photosynthesis come into this? Well, if you look at what determines the yield potential of a genotype, i.e. what that genotype will achieve on a piece of land if it has the water and nutrients it needs and it's defended from diseases and pests. And that's equivalent to the amount of solar energy available during the growing season, how good the crop is at capturing that solar energy, how good it is at then converting the captured solar energy into biomass, and finally, how good is it at partitioning that biomass into the parts of the crop we care about. So the grain of, of wheat, for example, the seed of soybean. Now, if we um, look at photosynthesis, I should just say photosynthesis is primarily this conversion efficiency. We need to compare it with what do we think the theoretical maximum is. And so what we've done here is to thermodynamically go through each step of the process. Here's a thousand kilojoules coming in. And if everything works perfectly, in a C3 crop like wheat, we could expect 46 kilojoules to end up <clears throat> in the biomass of that crop. So uh, conversion efficiency of about 4.6%. Now, our very best crops achieve a third of this at best, and most achieve about one-tenth. Now, if we look at what has happened since the Green Revolution, this is in our major crops, uh, wheat, rice, maize, soybean, for example. Then what we see is pre-Green Revolution figures for these three factors determining a yield potential. Post-Green Revolution, we see today that Interception efficiency has improved a lot. Crop gets out of the ground faster, more efficient at capturing radiation. Partitioning efficiency or harvest index has increased hugely since the Green Revolution. Pre-Green Revolution rice cultivars, about 30% ended up in the grain. Today it's over 60%. And if we're going to have any stem left, um, it's really hard to see how we're going to get much further than that. 
So you could say we've maxed out on the other factors, but photosynthesis conversion efficiency is barely changed. And the, um, this is Longping Yuan, who died a couple of years ago. He won the World Food Prize for breeding these amazing rice cultivars with these huge panicles. Here's the flag leaf, and the panicle is dropping right down to the paddy surface. What he's complaining about to me is that you physiologists are not giving me enough photosynthesis to fill all of my grain, grain initials. And this was also recognized by uh, Lloyd Evans, physiologist and wheat breeder, who basically pointed out that if we are going to double food production, and of course this was at the end of the last century, he couldn't see how it could be done unless we could engineer photosynthesis. But he was also sceptical as to whether that could be achieved. So where do we think we could do this today? First of all, we know more about photosynthesis than any other plant process. We know all of the steps in the process. We know the proteins. We know the structure of many of those proteins. We know the genes and gene families coding for those. Uh, we, we have many of the kinetic properties for those proteins. So we can actually simulate the whole process uh, in silico and probe it in, in silico. And then with crop genomes revealed in great detail now and crop engineering being more efficient, we believe this is something that we can move forward on. So how do we do that? The Green Revolution was a few genetic changes, but if we're trying to change photosynthesis, we've got over 100 steps there, um, and they're mostly quantitatively variable, which gives you an infinite number of possibilities. So one way to approach this is the systems analysis approach, which is used in manufacturing. So then really try and work out, if you have, a, for example, a car production line, where are your bottlenecks? You know, maybe it's making seats, so you need to move your workforce around so that you solve that. And so we set about trying to do that with photosynthesis. Uh, Jing Wanzhou, who started off with me as a PhD student, uh, this was about three years of work, coding every one of these as a differential equation, getting a complete system, and then since there's no analytical solution known, numerically integrating that. And when we tried to do that, it failed. Um, but luckily, we met Eric de Stuhler, who said, oh, I had exactly the same problem, and here's how I solved it. And so uh, we used his method, and indeed it did work for us, and that got us going. And then we asked him what he was doing. He was balancing rocket motors. But he did say what we were doing was actually more complex. So, so don't let anybody tell you plant science isn't rocket science. Um, once you can do that, then you can apply optimization routines to say, well, okay, this is where the protein's invested. How should it be redistributed to get the maximum output? And that's what we started doing. But of course, you have to take account of the fact that in the leaf, not every chloroplast is in the same position, same environment. And this was some of um, Stephen Drever's work where we've been looking at using X-ray CT, which if you like is a high throughput method now of looking at 3D leaf, leaf structure and then coding that into a model and um, so that we could then reproduce in, in silico the organization of the leaf palisade, spongy, etc. And then see if we can predict the light profiles. So the, here are the actual light profiles, here are the modeled ones. And then, of course, we have to take account of the fact that the environment of the leaf is changing all the time through the day and through the growth of the crop. So over several years, we could now start to make several predictions on what sort of improvement you could get in conversion efficiency by making different changes. And some of these, like converting C3 plants to C4, are obviously long term. Others, though, we thought could be done you know, in a five, 10 year time frame. 
Now, when, when we published this, of course, a lot of critics said, well, you've got no evidence that improving photosynthesis will increase productivity. But, but actually, we did, because this is um, an experiment on our farm in Illinois. Each of these spots you can see here is um, looking at a replicated experiment where we're elevating carbon dioxide in open air conditions. And so when you zoom in on one of these, you can see this ring around the crop. This is all soybean in here. And how this works is that if the wind is coming in this direction, the anemometer and um, wind vane here tell the computer to release CO2 from these rings so that it will release most CO2 from here and then it feathers out to the sides. And I make it sound easy, but the engineer who built this, Tim Mees, took him about a year to get it working. But basically, what he was able to do, and we've been doing this for 20 years now, is from planting right the way through to harvesting, to be able to get one minute averages of CO2 within 10% of the target for about 96% of, of the time. Uh, this is another illustration. One of the effects of CO2 is to partially close the stomates. So that, of course, makes the leaf slightly warmer. It's evaporating less water. And here you can see with this thermal imaging, you can see inside the ring, it's slightly warmer than outside. Well, what does this do to the crop? CO2 is a limiting substrate for C3 plants. So if you boost CO2, you boost photosynthesis. And when we measured photosynthesis, it was 20 to 25% higher. Did that result in more yield? Indeed, it did. In soybean, about 16%. Wheat, rice, 12 Wheat, 15 Now, since then, with many more experiments, we've also been able to see that some cultivars respond very strongly. And actually, these are the ones with the highest yield potential. And we assume these are the ones that breeders have managed to put the most sink strength into. So this tells us if we, if we artificially boost photosynthesis, we get more yield. So can we actually get that yield in practice? Well, all of what I've told you so far is modeling. Um, and you know, models, of course, on your computer can look very attractive, but when you've got to take this to the field, it doesn't look quite so nice. But nevertheless, we were able to get together a team of people who were willing to go where no sensible plant scientists had been before. <clears throat> and luckily, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation were about the only people who believed what we were saying. And after a sort of a year of discussion, they said, well, we put our money where your mouth is and you show us this can actually be done and we might give you a bit more. So, um, so this is the team we formed. It's several institutions ranging from ANU in Canberra, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, um, right, University of Cambridge, Essex and Lancaster in the UK and um, led by the University of Illinois. And we identified seven different ways that we would try and improve photosynthesis. And we believe three of these have actually shown that we can, can do this. So the way basically we work is from the models, we make predictions of what we think might be the best way to intervene. And then we test that in tobacco. And you think, why on earth does the Gates Foundation want to deal with tobacco? The reason we use tobacco is it's very quick to transform. You can go from transformation to your T1 seed in just five months. Um, and then if it works in the greenhouse, it produces a large amount of seed. So within 12 months, you can conduct a field trial. Now with wheat or soybean or rice, that's at least four years. So we use this as our filter on, okay, what do we think is really working and worth taking forward to the crops the Gates Foundation care about? And in our case, our particular focus is cowpea. This is the most important vegetable protein source 
in sub-Saharan Africa. And soybean, which is now an emerging uh, crop in, in Africa, another vegetable protein source. But they're also very interested in cassava, rice, um, maize, and sorghum. So I'll just tell you about three things we've been working on. The first of these is Cedaheptulos bisphosphatase. And the reason for this is our modeling. Um, this is what we find in our plant, the level of these different Calvin cycle enzymes. This is a logarithmic scale. And this is what the computer said we should have to optimize the system. And this one stood out to us because it said, well, there should be seven times more of this enzyme than there is. And there's really not much of it to start with. So, you know, you would have thought Natural selection or breeder selection would have done this already. But anyway, Christine Rains, University of Essex, have put this into tobacco, upregulated SBPAs. In the greenhouse, these look to be bigger plants. So we went back to our modeling and we puzzled over this. And then somebody suggested to us, well, the crop ancestors evolved in a CO2 concentration, which is about half the level we have today. So we reran the model at that level. And this enzyme had no control over CO2 fixation. But at today's level, it did. And in future CO2, it had an even greater control. And we also noted that as temperature increases, the control of this enzyme got higher. So we had a means to test this in our soy face project. And we put Christine Rain's plants in our soy face rings, and sure enough, the yield response was bigger in elevated CO2. Now, Karbanaki, who is here, also developed this open air heating system, okay, using radiators to warm up the surface of the canopy, and by now we had this in soybean. And using thermal imaging, he can precisely, con with feedback control, elevate the temperature within here. And his postdoc um, then did this work with soybean. And sure enough, the factorial combination of temperature and CO2 gave a bigger yield um, than the control. And I should point out, though, that that three degree elevation of temperature hugely decreased soybean yield. So what we were doing was essentially bringing it back to what the plant can achieve today. So if you like, it was a way of future-proofing soybean, but not actually making it better. Now, one of the things my lab has been closely involved in is accelerating the recovery of non-photochemical quenching when the leaf goes from full sunlight to shade. Um, now, why is this important? Well, within the crop canopy, the leaf at the very top um, we'll, on a clear sky day, we'll see sunlight like this. So, bell-shaped curve. If you go just one layer down, what you see is this, that throughout the day it's going in and out of full sunlight. So this is the shade of just one leaf, reduces the light level of the leaf going into shade by about 90%. So it's going in and out all day long. When this happens, so here is leaf CO2 uptake, so the light drops here, and of course photosynthesis drops, but it drops much lower than it actually needs to because this is a steady state level. So this is all lost carbon. And over the course of the day, that can add up to 20 to 40% of potential carbon assimilation. So why is the leaf... Uh, taking this time to recover. Well, when a leaf is in full sunlight, it's receiving more light energy than it can use. So chlorophyll absorbs that light. It goes into the singlet except excited state. And then, of course, some of that is used to drive photosynthesis, returning it back to the ground state. But photosynthesis is not enough to use all of this by far. So... If it remains in the singlet state, it can go to triplet state. Triplet state can react with molecular oxygen, producing 
singlet oxygen, and an array of oxidizing radicals, which would literally bleach the leaf. So, of course, evolution has dealt with this by the, a process called non-photochemical quenching. It will take this excess energy and release it as, as heat. So essentially what is happening in full sunlight, um, photosynthesis is going on, a large amount of that absorbed energy is being lost as heat to protect the leaf. But when it goes into the shade, when it could now use all of that light for photosynthesis, this process carries on for many minutes before eventually we, we end up with the relaxed state. So we looked at how we could improve this and from our modeling, we predicted that we needed to upregulate two enzymes we call vilaxanthin deoxidase, zeaxanthin epoxidase, and also from knowledge of Arabidopsis, upregulate this third protein, PSBS, which um, in attenuates non photochemical quenching. Um, so, what these enzymes are doing in highlight. VDE is converting vilaxanthin to zeaxanthin. As we go into shade, zeaxanthin epoxidase converts it back to vilaxanthin. The absorption spectra of these major xanthophils are different. And so um, we do know that using hyperspectral, there's a possibility of picking these up. And that, that's a very tantalizing um, aspect for um, filled phenotyping or phenotyping of this trait. That... Now, what I want to explain now is what, what's going on. So what we see, zeaxanthin is converted to vilaxanthin. We have, have this cycle. Zeaxanthin is involved in, is critical to this non-photochemical quenching. So what people have reasoned before is, well, to relax faster, we upregulate zeaxanthin epoxidase. But when you do that, you then decrease non-photochemical quenching, expose the leaf to photo damage. Now, what our modeling said was, counterintuitively, you need to upregulate VDE as well, so that basically, in high light, you maintain your zeaxanthin content. But when you go to low light, you remove that zeaxanthin more, more rapidly. Um, a danger, of course, is if you upregulate this too much, then you get more non-photochemical quenching than you need. And again, you inhibit photosynthesis. So this is the desired phenotype. And I want to tell you, getting that desired phenotype is not as easy as it sounds on the diagram. So Chris Nayogi and Laurie Leonelli at UC Berkeley uh, developed this construct for us with that would upregulate ZEP, VDE, and PSBS. Um, Van Akromdijk and Kasia Glarker, who were postdocs with me at the time, put this into tobacco. Now, that sounds easy. You put your construct in, great, you've got what you want. But actually, when you put in a construct like that, epigenetic effects result in all sorts of different expression combinations. So, what we had to do was, from all the seedlings, try and pick out the ones that showed the desired phenotyping. And this is where modulated chlorophyll fluorescence came in. We could start to pick up ones which showed the same level of MPQ in highlight, but faster relaxation when they went into the shade. And so from basically from 60 separate genetic events, we only had three which really showed that desired phenotype. And then when we looked at the expression of the proteins, indeed, these were the ones that were strongly overexpressing VDE and ZEP at similar levels and, and PSBS. And what that resulted in was this fast relaxation of MPQ and about double the amount of CO2 fixation lost, sorry, halved the amount of CO2 fixation lost on this transition from sun to shade. That resulted in bigger plants in the greenhouse. And luckily, um, so I should also say that in steady state conditions, 
the efficiency of CO2 fixation was unchanged, but it was higher in fluctuating light. So in the field, this resulted in a substantial increase in productivity, and that got us onto the cover of science. Curiously, though, science put a soybean plant on the front cover. We figured this was because science hardly ever publish an agricultural paper. Um, but it was prescient because that was what we were thinking of next, doing this in uh, soybean. And Amanda D'Souza and Stephen Burgess led this work. And he bought, this time from 60 transformants, we had about eight expressing these proteins. Five of those in the field showed a very substantial increase in seed yield. I should say when we published the tobacco paper, we got a lot of criticism because, well, you can do this in tobacco. You'd never be able to do it in a food crop because of sink limitation. But luckily that didn't prove to be the case. And what was very encouraging was that when we looked at protein and oil content, there were no real changes in these um, seed quality. So we were getting 25% improvement in seed yield without any loss of protein content, which told us that the plant, some of that photosynthate must be being fed to the nodules, fixing nitrogen, because um, in common with agricultural practice in the Midwest, the soybean is not, not fertilized. And luckily this time, science got the right plant on the cover. So, so um, we also, Amanda repeated this the next year in our um, soy face experiment because we were curious, well, if you boost photosynthesis with CO2 as well as transgenically, can you still see further increases? And indeed we could here in elevated CO2, total number of seeds um, was going up. And also we noted the harvest index goes up as well. Um, and that's something we've seen in our soy face experiment consistently. Now, one of the criticisms we had on our first experiment was where they were single row plots. So we've now got out four row plots and these are under the spider cam system. So uh, here you can see one of the 100 meter odd pylons which supports the spider cam. So these are being imaged this year by, by that system. Unfortunately, harvest hasn't taken place yet, so I can't tell you those results. Um, you might wonder, well, how is all of this going to help the Bill and Melinda Gates target of improving yields for poor farmers in countries other than the United States and the EU? They, Bill Gates has set up a new division, Agricultural Innovations, and they're their goal is to take innovations like this and actually get them into crops which count in the poorest countries in the world. One of the projects they've started to support is this one which is putting BT into cowpea, which is now um, available to farmers in, in Nigeria. And this was done by TJ Higgins, who's been working with Nigerian breeders for 20 years. And he's now taken our traits and put them into cowpea, which are now being tested in, on our farm in Puerto Rico. Um, so finally, I just want to tell you a little bit about C4 photosynthesis, which is one of my pet interests. Um, and this is concerning what happens when we go the other way from shade to sun in the canopy. And in maize and sorghum and sugarcane, you see these long lags before you get back up to steady state. Now, what has to happen in a C4 plant is CO2 is assimilated in the mesophyll into oxaloacetate, malate. That goes to the bundle sheath where CO2 is released um, to concentrate CO2 and essentially eliminate photorespiration in the bundle sheath. Now, Again, we developed a C4 model for this, and, uh, which incorporated all the aspects of dynamics. And 
to make a long story short, it showed that two proteins, two regulatory proteins, were really the slowest aspect of this. Um, and in the modeling, we were able to capture largely what we could see. Here is the uh, measured data. Here is the modeled. So we could get pretty close to what we could see in, in the plant itself, which told us we probably captured most of the dynamics. And one of the key things it told us was that activation of Rubisco was probably the slowest step. Now, CO2 is concentrated in the bundle sheath. So because of this concentration gradient, a small amount leaks back into the mesophyll. But if Rubisco is not activated and we're pumping CO2 in, more will diffuse back, then has to be reassimilated and cycled round. Now, C13O2, the naturally occurring isotope of um, carbon diffuses slightly more slowly than C12O2. So if you keep doing this, you increase discrimination. And you can then pick that up. And indeed, um, using tunable diode laser in Carl Bernacchi's lab, should say this looks tiny, but it's actually about a six foot long optical bench. And it, it came in a, in a box just over six foot long, and it was left out the lab for some time. And somebody put a, a label on it saying Steve Long's exit plan. Um, but, but, but this has actually now become a high throughput way of measuring mesophyll conductance in C3 plants and CO2 leakage in C4 plants. And Sam Stutz, working with us, now tested this hypothesis that if Rubisco is really limiting this, we should be seeing greater discrimination against C13. And, and that's exactly what we saw. And this paper is now um, in, in proof with new phytologists. So that told us we needed to upregulate Rubisco activase. <clears throat> if you want to know more about what we're doing, we do have a website, ripe.illinois.edu. That's my lab's website as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Very nice talk. Are there any questions for Steve? Thank you for a nice talk. I was really wondering how are the improvements in the MPQ going to affect yield under drought stress? Do you have like any predictions from your model? Because drought stress is closing the stomata, therefore reducing the CO2 concentrations. And how is that? Is that going to kind of reverse the modeling back to previous CO2 levels? Or Yeah, that's a good question. And we don't really know the answer <laughs> at this stage, I'm afraid. Um, what is happening now with the, this particular material is it's being trialled over about 10 different sites, spreading from Nebraska right across to Indiana. And, and so Nebraska is generally much drier, and we may start to get clues on this. But yeah, yeah that is an issue that we're looking at. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm. Hello, thank you for the talk. I have a curiosity. Could you comment on the system of differential equations? Why it didn't work and what was the fix? Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, the, the reason why, well, and I think it's been quite common with um, dealing with photosynthesis because you've got processes acting at very different time scales. It's, it's, it you know, becomes a very stiff system, which means that you have to use incredibly small time steps. Um, and and in, with every time step, there's a small error. So that can cause, the, in the end, the error becomes so big that 
the answer's meaningless. And what, what we used, and this was done in MATLAB, is an algorithm called ODE15S, um, which is, has proved to be one of the best of dealing with stiff systems. And we, of course, were not aware of the fact that balancing rocket motors has exactly the same problem, but <laughs> that's why Eric was using that and showed us how to use it and implement it. And it, it solved the problem perfectly, yeah. So, but it is a, you know, it's one of these many variable time step methods of numerical integration. Yeah, thank you very much, great talk. And it proved me I am wrong. Yeah. Because I was a strong promoter of the sink, you know, the sink source yes. effects. But I, I have it to admit your work was great. I do have a question, a curiosity more than anything else, because at the beginning, you really mentioned the quantitatively, you know, I'm a QTL guy. Mm. And uh, to what extent, if any, you have looked at also a historical series of genotypes released in the different crops to see to what extent also the natural uh, haplotype diversity for quantitative trait at your target mm. somehow backed up your wonderful chapeau, mm. Uh, mm. what you did find. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we, and of course, I mean, this is somewhere where high throughput phenotyping becomes really important because we are now looking at what natural variation there is in this speed of relaxation. And we, we have found some. And we, well, within soybean, we have found some. And we can see that at least Glycine soja, you know, the wild ancestor of soybean, appears to be somewhat slower than the um, germplasm we have today. And we've been looking at a few different traits, comparing them. And um, you know, recently been looking at mesophyll and stomatal conductance. Um, and we can definitely see that stomatal conductance has increased with breeder selection, which does give you slightly more photosynthesis, but gives you a lower water use efficiency. But we are, this particular MPQ trait, we do see some variation. And so we're very curious as to what underlies that, you know, using GWAS and TWAS to see whether there are other genes we might be adding in uh, there, and whether how much of this effect we could get through conventional breeding rather than genetic engineering. So, yeah.